Welcome, welcome everybody today to the third recognition and rewards festival. And also, that's why I was waiting. Welcome also everybody who's joining us online. Um, great to have you all here in this wonderful church. Uh, and also great to have you here joining us uh, online today. Um, this is the third time the recognition and rewards uh, festival. Uh, and uh, whenever it's the third time, as you all know, it's a tradition. So it's now officially a uh, tradition. Great to have you here. Uh, my name is Eveline van Rijswijk. Uh, I'm a moderator and science communicator. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to be here today with you. Um, and I wanted to ask already who uh, was here before or who joined a recognition and rewards festival before? Probably online, but great. Welcome back. Who is here for the first time? During the wow, it's even a larger portion. Um, Today is all about rethinking assessment. Uh, how do we assess uh, excellence? And also, how do we achieve a culture and system change when it comes to recognition and rewards in academia? And which uh, opportunities, uh, challenges, and dilemmas do you see? Um, so feel free to share your today, your concerns maybe about uh, research and recognition, um, and uh, maybe your dilemmas you face. Um, Another question for you. Um, who says I deserve more recognition in my work? <laughs> OK. Who, say, who says I deserve more rewards for my work? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Good, good to know in advance. Um, and who of you would like to see a different form of assessment in academia? That's also a large part, yeah. I hope if you're joining us online, you also do this uh, in your living room. Um, so what will we do in this uh, plenary op opening session? We have a column. We have two short uh, round tables. And the Minister of Education, Culture and Science will join us. But first, we will kick off with uh, Joke van Sane, the Rector Magnificus of the University of Humanistic Studies. Uh, she's since 2019, and she holds the chair Meaning and Leadership. And Kim Huypen, National Program Manager, Recognition and Rewards. Please give them a warm hand. Um, Joke, uh, you're hosting us today in this wonderful church. We're around the corner of the University of Humanistic Studies. Um, why did you find it so important to host this festival? Yeah, thank you. And let me welcome you again as uh, director of this university. It's a great honor for us to have you here all. Um, it's important for us because, well, I'd like to mention that uh, since the 1st of January, we are associate member of the uh, Union of Universities. So it's a, it's a sort of confirmation of that uh, membership. And um, recognition and rewards, it matches perfectly with the mission and vision of our university. Because uh, we like to contribute to a humane society for all people. And you can only do so if you not only focus us on research, but also on education and societal impact. Yeah. Great. And so for us, it's, um, it's very urgent. It's also very relevant. And maybe it's nice to mention here that uh, we already um, started a chair with an impact profile. And as a chair, we, met, we uh, appointed Dr. Menno Hurekamp on it. And uh, the agenda of that chair is on democracy. Democracy as human work, democracy as mensenwerk with a strict impact profile, and that matches perfectly with our university. Yeah. Yeah. Great to hear. Uh, Kim is the National Program Manager. Um, why rethinking assessment? Why, why is that the theme today? Yeah, thank you. And I'm also very happy to see all of you, because indeed it is the third recognition rewards uh, festival, but the first one where we actually see uh, all the people that, joining, that are joining us. Um, so we started with our program on recognition area awards in uh, 2020, just after publishing the position paper Room for Influence T Talent in 2019. Um, and when we started the program, we thought, well, uh, we should take a little bit of time to um, uh, not develop new criteria, for example, for, for teaching, for impact, for patient care, for leadership, 
uh, and other cr criteria, of course, for, for research, not too quickly, because we don't want to go from one tick box exercise to another tick box exercise. We need to take time to, um, to develop visions, to translate the position paper to our own context as universities, university medical centers, research institutes, uh, and of, of course, uh, uh, the funders and the ones of today. But I think now, um, yeah, it, it is time to uh, really invent, reinvent new criteria, uh, really rethink assessment. Uh, and it's also timely because this uh, agreement on research assessment was published this summer. It's an international agreement. We're really, really happy with that uh, international agreement here in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, we started uh, developing this festival just after the summer. So we thought, well, this is assessment is the word. But of course, for our, from our recognition and rewards point of view, not only research assessment, uh, so, but also teaching, but also impact, but also leadership, but also patient care. So it's much broader and it might, yeah, and we also thought, well, assessment, should we assess that much? Uh, should we assess everyone every year? So that's where the rethinking word came in. So uh, perhaps we just focus a little bit more on development and a little bit less on assessment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what's your view on rethinking assessment, uh, Joke? Yes, I, 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 as teachers, we all know that assessment is a driving motivation for learning processes. So if we don't change assessment of research and assessment of leadership and assessment of teaching, nothing will change. So I think uh, it's absolutely necessary to change and to develop uh, different forms of assessment, both in research as in teaching and leadership and well, organizational citizenship. Yeah. yeah. And since you're also a professor of meaning and leadership, you're an expert on, on leadership, okay. uh, what would you say should uh, leadership in academia look like? What's important? Well, I, th I think two things are important now. And the first thing is uh, that we have to realize that this is a real and big transformation we are in. So um, as universities, we need transformational leadership. We need awareness of uh, that something is really changing and that um, we need to realize that there will give some uncertainty, things will fail, we will not all be successful. So we need to have time, again, time for development, for um, well reaching maybe the more existential dimension of being an academic because I think the biggest risk of what's going on now is that we uh, think well recognition and rewards is just another checklist and we can only have another checklist of education and teaching and leadership and that's it so we need to realize it's in a real transformation so that's the first thing and the other thing is within academia I think uh, leadership uh, is also um, important because we aren't just individuals for now we are assessed as individuals but in academia, in university, we work in teams. So our contribution to teams, our responsibility for the team, for the university, we call it in our university organizational leadership, organizational citizenship. I think that's very important and we have to assess that as well. Yeah. Um, Kim, what do you hope for today? What are your expectations? Well, um, I... I've been looking forward to this day, I think, for, for more than half a, half a year. Um, because when we did this call for workshops uh, in autumn, um, we were so happy that we got so many reactions. Um, so that's the first thing, that there are so many people involved already in recognition rewards that I, yeah, I just know a handful of you and uh, all the others I don't know yet. So, so I really hope to get to know you uh, I really hope that we, we have dialogue, uh, that you feel free, um, um, feel safe to share your concerns as well and your, and your dilemmas, uh, that we can talk about it. Uh, but I also am very happy that um, um, yeah, we just, we just uh, published this uh, route card, roadmap, uh, recognition and rewards in practice. And I think all the workshops will show that Recognition and rewards is already in pra practice. That there are numerous um, experiments uh, going on and pilots, uh, and I hope they will inspire you to, um, yeah, to take that back to your own uh, specific context and and work further on changing the way we recognize uh, our rewards, our academics, and 
to make uh, academia a really inspiring and healthy environment to work in. Thank you. Uh, and what do you hope for today? Yes, I, I hope <laughs> uh, quite the same uh, as, as Kim also said. I, I think we hope, I hope we can share our good practices and bad practices. I hope we can share our concerns and I hope that at the end of the day, you not only think, well, that University of Humanistic Studies, that's a great place to be, I hope that also, but I also hope that you think, well, that recognition and rewards program, that festival, that means something and something is changing and it gives you hope, I hope, hope and direction uh, for future. I think you'll get a great assessment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kim Hack and Joke of Um So we have uh, two columnists today, two columns, one in this opening session and one in the plenary closing. Uh, closing session. And our first columnist of today uh, is Hike Huistra. She's an assistant professor at the Utrecht University, historian of science and medicine, and also a science columnist for the Dutch newspaper Trouw. We asked her to give her view on recognition and rewards. So please give her a warm welcome, Hike Huistra. <laughs> on this beautiful place. Yeah, so I was asked to, to talk or to read about recognition and, and reward, obviously. So I've been thinking about different ways to recognize and reward academic work. And especially uh, about the necessity of having both small and big rewards. Some of the most valuable rewards I have received for my academic work were very small, simple remarks from students, uh, from colleagues, from people who read some of the things I wrote. An example, a colleague read a book review I wrote, and she sent me an email to tell me that after reading my review, she finally understood what it was that had been bothering her about the book when she read it. Uh, another example, an email from someone who just wrote to say they enjoyed reading my column. And a final example, a first-year student who came to me at the end of a mandatory history of science course and said that he wanted to thank me for the lectures because he learned a lot and he had never expected that history of science could actually be interesting. <laughs> this is a reward, of course, that you could also easily interpret as an insult, but I like my glass half full. Um, small gestures like these, um, I think, mean a lot. And we all get them from time to time, I hope. And even better, we can also all easily hand them out regularly. And in that way, recognize the work that others do. And we can all tell a colleague how much we value their commitment to student well-being, for example. We can all send an email to the organizers of the conference or the festival that we recently attended, thank them for their efforts, and tell them what we've learned. And we can and we should all send public or private messages of support to a colleague who has been fired because they had tried to address gender inequality in their institution. Such gestures add meaning to our days and to our lives, I think. And in that sense, they're invaluable. At the same time, they are worth absolutely nothing. Nice words from a colleague do not help you pay the bills in the months that you're in between temporary postdoc positions. And showing a Teacher of the Year award does not help to, to convince the bank to lend you money to buy a house. The only way to get a stable income and a mortgage is through getting the biggest reward that we have in academia, the permanent contract. And to me, saying that a permanent contract is the biggest reward in academia feels like stating the obvious. But not everyone agrees with that sentiment. Although the people who disagree, in my experience, tend to do have a permanent contract themselves. Not too long ago, for example, uh, I had a conversation with a dean and he told me that he did not understand why the quote, young generation 
always went on about permanent contracts, since there was nothing wrong with being on a temporary contract. This is the remark I think that you only make if you have had a permanent contract for a very, very long time and thus have completely forgotten what it is like to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and first thing realizing that your contract ends next year and that you have absolutely no idea where you can go next. In my experience, getting a permanent contract is crucial, not only to ensure that you have enough money and stability in your personal life, but also to truly feel that you belong to the academic world. It is what makes you a long-term member of the academic community. And one of the main challenges for the Recognition and Rewards program is, I think, that currently this big reward is not handed out often enough, and that when a permanent contract is offered, this still happens largely based on research accomplishments. For some universities, including, I am ashamed to say, my own, this is even explicit policy. Employees who teach full-time do not get permanent positions, no matter how good their course evaluations are or how many teaching awards they win. If you don't excel in research, you can't get in. If we want the recognition and rewards ideals to become truly part of academic culture, this needs to change. We can install teaching awards, open science grants, or outreach prizes all we want. But if we continue to hand out permanent contracts based mainly on research accomplishments, and if we give them to a select few only, we are not really making room for everyone's talent. Structural academic work deserves a permanent academic contract, always, and not just if that structural work involves research. Thank you. Thank you, Hike Huistra. Let's uh, continue our program with uh, a round table, and I would also like to invite you to ask your questions uh, during the uh, round table, uh, share your insights and ideas. Uh, let me first introduce my two panel members. Uh, Marieke Adriaanse, Professor of Behavioral Interventions in Population Health at LUMC, and co-lead of the Recognition and Rewards Program, Academia in Motion of Leiden University. Let's give a warm hand already. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jarin Eski, Assistant Professor in Public Administration, an advocate of making the academic work, uh, workplace a bit friendlier, less competitive, and overall mentally, behind brackets, healthier. He was a member and later chair of the Amsterdam Young Academy. Jarin Eski, give him a warm hand. Welcome. Um, may I start with you? Um, what would you say uh, is uh, academic excellence? Okay, so, oh, yes, it should be on the chin. Yeah. Um, we're starting with a very difficult question. I know, it's the, it's the most difficult one. Yeah, I think um, I have two answers to that question. Um, because it is a, a, a very hollow term, I think, mm -hmm. academic excellence, a very loaded term at the same time. So maybe to start with the first uh, aspect, uh, to me personally, um, academic excellence is very difficult uh, to give meaning to without context. Uh, so e excellence, uh, I think if you look in a dictionary, dictionary, probably says something like very good or exceptionally good, and I think we understand what that means. But what does it mean to be an excellent or very good academic? I don't. Are we talking about someone giving a, a bachelor courses or supervising PhD students? Uh, maybe uh, conducting a lab experiment, writing grants, or supporting people who are writing grants. So, without context, I don't really know how to give meaning to that, but even if we focus on one specific domain, I think if we talk about excellence, we tend to immediately think about research. Um, then I also need more context, because if you're conducting a, a blue skies, a very fundamental study, then 
uh, what is considered excellent is probably something very different than when I'm uh, conducting a translational study and I want to make impact on a societal pressing issue. So I guess to me personally it is a very uh, multifaceted uh, construct that requires a context in order to be meaningful and without context is rather uh, meaningless. Yeah. But the, the other answer, it, uh, I think it, it's not so uh, interesting what I think is excellent, uh, academic excellence because it also is a very loaded term. I think a couple of years ago the Rathenau Institute published a report, um, I think it's called something like Excellence is Extraordinary where they show that excellence has very strong connotations after 30 years of excellence-driven policy. So it's about research, it's about the individual, it's about fundamental research, it's about competition based on uniform uh, indicators. Um, and I'm becoming increasingly skeptical that we can get rid of those connotations, that we can shake those, so then if that is the case, then maybe we should refrain from using uh, this terminology altogether. Yeah. Jarin, do you agree? What's your view on, uh, on excellence? Sh should we still use the term? Or? Um, it kind of reminds me of using the word rigor. Uh, I've, I've been a senior lecturer in the UK for quite a while, and there the word rigor was basically yeah, the thing you want to have when you publish, when you do research, um, rigorous courses, uh, you name it. But no one really actually knew what they were working towards to, yeah. um, only that you have to have rigor in order to get promoted. Ah. Uh, one of the three um, elements that you had to fulfill next to inter internationalization and something else I already forgot about. And this is kind of what triggers me, uh, triggers my critique really when I hear excellence. It's the same kind of uh, wording for something that is so vague, so open that it can be applied to anything and can be used for anything. So for me, it's also important who decides what is excellent mm -hmm. actually, and who says that it's not excellent. So um, there's that. I think what, what, what excellence also does is that as we don't know where we're working towards to, people do a lot for it, maybe a bit too much. And then we head towards the health and mental health component. Yeah. In working overtime, yeah, like structurally working in the weekends, yeah, bec structurally. Because you wrote an article mm. in, uh, for Science Guide on unhealthy academic behavior, um, so maybe if we get rid of the excellence thing, uh, it's also better for uh, healthy behavior in academia. Um, could it help? It could help to rethink uh, excellence. Yeah, it could help. I mean, it's 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 more structural than that, I think. Um, but if you think about, how, if, if we do not know where to work towards to, right, then, then how do we know we ever will fulfill? When is it satisfactory? When are you yourself satisfied? Uh, that is, I think, even more important than someone else telling you you've done an excellent job. Uh, I mean, I've been told, I've provided or delivered excellent papers, papers of which I thought, hmm, they were actually really not that interesting, mm. uh, to be <laughs> honest, uh, compared to other papers I've delivered that are far more interesting but are not published in a peer-reviewed journal, for example. Mm. Um, so it's also very confusing when people say this is excellent or this is not excellent. And, and I think that, all, that, that really makes it more difficult to, to perform in a, in a domain where things are already quite difficult, yeah. uh, especially at the moment. We're ending up with more questions than answers, I guess, yeah. So, but how do you deal with this in a, in, on a daily basis? I mean, um, you're the uh, co-lead of the Recognition and Rewards Program, Academia in Motion. So we have this, this excellence question, we have the assessment question. How do you combine that? How do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, I think what you are saying is correct. It's still, uh, there's a lot of open questions. So maybe first, uh, one thing I want to point out when I say that we have to be careful with, with using excellence, to me that is something very different than talking about quality, because I do think that what we want, yeah. also within the recognition and rewards program, at least how I view it, we want to increase the quality of our work in all of the domains. Um, I just, I'm not sure that excellence is a, a useful concept. So how do we deal with that on, uh, uh, in our program? So we are in, in Leiden now at the stage um, where we are um, uh, trying to use an evidence-based approach to find good quality indicators uh, for all of the domains, for teaching, for research, uh, but also for leadership. Um, um, 
And there's, of course, also a lot of expertise that we can use. So as scientists, we uh, 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 talk a lot about how our work is evaluated, but there's actually also a whole scientific uh, discipline which um, uh, studies how uh, quality indicators work or which side effects uh, they give. Yeah. So we want to use that information, but also um, um, a more bottom-up initiatives. So talking to people in different faculty at different career stages. Um, and I think that's the very first step, to talk again about what we mean by quality. Uh, and I think that is very much dependent on the goals of what you're trying to achieve. And that is what I tried to say earlier. Yeah. Uh, depending on uh, your objectives, for example, with your research program or your teaching program or what you're expecting of something, quality has a, a different meaning. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a conversation that we sh should be having and that we um, haven't been having in, in recent years. Yeah. And how, how would it work? How far are you with defining quality indicators or is it still work in progress? Yes, very much, very much work in progress. Also not something that I will define or that we will define, it's something that we will do together. Mm -hmm. um, and that will also not be something that is uniform for all of the different disciplines and uh, uh, faculties. There's no one size fits all. No. Uh, here, and I think uh, that also means that you have to involve a lot of people, and it also takes time. Yeah. How, how do you, would you say we should assess quality of researchers? How would you like to be assessed? Um, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Tell him when, we, when we're drinking coffee afterwards. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, um, I, I, what, what the columnist just said about students giving you uh, a nice compliment. Um, I also think that that is actually really, really important uh, to get acknowledgement from the people you um, manage, the people you teach, um, and not just nice words, but also taking care of one another. So mm -hmm. if you yourself have dark circles underneath your eyes and your student assistants see that every single day, then you can start to wonder whether they think that's normal, yes or no. And I think that's where uh, quality of research actually begins. Because if you are unhealthy, and you give that same example to others, what kind of knowledge are we producing then? If unhealthy researchers are structurally, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, producing excellence, uh, but is that really excellent? Um, I also, this is maybe actually quite, quite strange to say, but one of my friends, he, he works on the Zuidas, uh, I as well, but he works on the real side of us, as he always says. Um, For a bank or a <laughs> company? Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> and he always says, like, okay, yeah, we, we make the money and you spend it. So, in, in his opinion, researchers are money wasters. Yeah? Okay, we all know that that's not the case. Um, but at the same time, when I talk about the problems we have in academia, he's quite surprised. Like, is that not arranged? Is your promotion track not clear? How is that possible? Uh, what do you say? What do you mean, academic care? You need to care for that's like normal behavior, right? That you look out for one another. Um, so I'm just trying to say that within our our work, um, it's actually not that um, yeah taken for granted uh, that we are healthy healthy researchers, healthy academics. Whereas in other sectors more likely that that is the case um, so yeah, so besides the the, the the small rewards and gestures that he can mentioned in a column we also have to formalize um, healthy behavior actually yes most definitely and, and we should definitely be careful in not setting the wrong example on a structural basis that, that begins with self-reflection what am I doing it's 10 o'clock in the evening I'm still writing emails uh, my kids are screaming. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. That, that, that is actually maybe a stupid example, but unfortunately, stupid example. Yeah. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question or share an insight or an idea? Feel free to raise your hand. Yes, and maybe stand up and also mention your name, please. And I'm also checking online whether. Hi, I'm Linda Hartman. I work for CWI, one of the NWO institutes. Um, so we're very much a research-based organization. Um, I'm also 
one day we can Utrecht as professor there, so I see perhaps more Could things. Could you hold the microphone a little bit higher? Yeah. More things going in Utrecht. Um, and my question, where I'm worried about is that those in the past who have been able to solve the constraints of the reward system as it has been in the, I don't know, last decades, um, and we put in new constraints for this new reward system, how can we ensure it's not the same people that still achieve the highest rewards? So we have a new reward system, and how do we make sure the same people get the highest rewards? Would you have an ID? Um, do you mean that recognition awards is not just another a new yasha, uh, a, a, new, a new way of, of <laughs> making things better, but actually, uh, and therefore, the same structural problems uh, persist, and the same people, whoever they are. Uh, I, I think that the... We get the same indicators? The, the indicators are going to be different. I see the indicators being different. But my question is, is it going to be the same people that in the past have gathered all the rewards for themselves. They see this as a constraint-solving system, so they, in the future, will attract all the rewards to themselves again. That, that's my question. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the um, um, important aspects here is, for example, uh, leadership. So if you put people, uh, we talk a lot when we talk about assessment and excellence, we have a tendency to talk about uh, research. I think that's a symptom of the problem that we're trying to address. Uh, um, uh, we do uh, many different things, and I think that if we uh, take leadership qualities also more seriously, and we look at, uh, we try to uh, create different profiles for the people who we promote, for example, to professor who are uh, supervising new generations of PhD students, um, um, and who are giving uh, new types of examples we can change. Um, and if it's the same people who make those changes and who come better uh, uh, advisors, who make sure that we have a, um, a good cooperation, that we work together in a healthy way, that we reward different aspects of our ad academic work, I'm happy that if it's the same people. I have no problem with a certain person or with certain people. I think we need to change the way that we work. Um, and I think that one of the things we can uh, use to do that is uh, by changing the, the incentives. Okay, would you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think something that needs to happen is that as soon as you get promoted, especially if you get a permanent contract, that part of that new task or that permanent task that you get is looking back to where you came from, literally. Like, okay, I just left behind a postdoc position, a uh, PhD position, I'm now an assistant professor, for example, with a permanent contract. Okay, what can I do? What, do I, what can I give back? That's actually also leadership, basic leadership, I think. Uh, but that is something that is really uh, not that common because as soon as you're an assistant professor, you look upwards. How can I become an associate? And then how can I become a full chair? Um, maybe those who are retiring, they, they, they <laughs> feel something else. Uh, a sense of uh, loss of, of sense of meaning in their work because they're not a academic or at least not a full chair anymore. But until that point, we only look upwards. Um, I think that is also a very structural problem uh, and, and should be changing uh, at least. And it begins with yeah, taking care of those who are depending on you, uh, quite literally. Thank you. Yeah. I have to say to the people watching, uh, I have to apologize that the live stream isn't working properly for everyone. So I have to, uh, sorry for that. Hopefully you will see me now when I'm saying this. Um, other questions from the audience? Yes, over here. And mention your name, please. Thanks, Chris Hartgring for Liberate Science. And I wanted to ask a bit about, uh, so Hike very aptly brought up the case from uh, Groningen, from Suzanne Teuber, and I want to ask, uh, the slogan says, room for everyone's talent, but we see that some talent is rewarded more than others, especially when it comes in terms of what, what talent is being, quote unquote, punished in this specific case, but also in general, we still see a lot of people leaving academia, especially women and people of color. Uh, so 
I wanted to ask, how do you feel about that? Like, what's the opposite of what we're talking about in terms of recognition and rewards? Where do we have to think about, you know, what isn't being uh, discussed when we talk about excellence, but what, are, what behavior is being punished that we want to see more of in our universities? So instead of recognizing and rewarding, we should punish certain behavior? <laughs> I didn't get the last part. <laughs> The question is, what behavior is being punished right now that, uh, that we should change because it's not creating the room for everyone as we would like it? Yeah, what behavior should be? Okay. Who would like to respond? Do you have an idea how we could do this? Well, I can, uh, I can tell you a personal uh, story. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's, it's punished, but I recently became a, a full professor and I had to give my inaugural lecture. Um, and what everyone was telling me that I have to make sure that I look like a real professor, right? So I have to be very confident and I cannot talk about my uncertainties. So that is exactly what I, uh, I did. I think one of the things that we should bring back to academia is this fact that we are also uh, humans. Uh, and that uh, we can also talk about what we find difficult. Uh, and that also means when we talk about working overtime, I, I initially I tried to, uh, I had a very strict policy, for example, to not send emails in the evening. And that ended up becoming very artificial. So I would delay my emails. Yeah. So it looked like I wasn't working in the evening. Uh, and I had to conclude that this is actually giving the wrong example because I'm not being transparent. I made, I had all of a sudden, that's a weird thing when you become a professor, I was all of a sudden asked to do all kinds of different things. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not all of a sudden better in doing research, but I'm now a professor. So I got all these opportunities. I had no script for that. So I said yes to everything. <laughs> so uh, I had to cancel part of my Christmas holiday. Um, uh, <laughs> and of course, that's not the example, but I, what I want to give. But I talked to my team about it. I also had less time for them. I say, okay, now I'm saying all of these things about recognizing awards, and I'm actually not spending so much time supervising you. I have to find a better way to balance. And I think it's this transparency and vulnerability, uh, which is actually sometimes punished mm. because people say that it, yeah, maybe I don't look like a real professor while well, here I am and this is <laughs> all I can do. So um, uh, I think being open and transparent and also telling to each other what we find scary, including being on this stage talking to all of you about this. We just talked about that too. Uh, that that's also uh, something we shouldn't punish, but maybe celebrate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to uh, respond as well? Yeah. Um, and I think I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the the stuff that we punish nowadays, like being vulnerable, for example, um, that is actually really weird. And and just think about it. Who delays their email to appear as if they're doing healthy work? Uh, I've, I've done it myself. Are you shaving it uh, now after you're doing it as well? Oh, we have one more. We have one uh, more. No, I think, and, and many more of my friends in academia do it as well. Um, and, and also regarding the punishment, uh, recently a good friend of mine, she, she left the field. Uh, and I came, I came back home and I was like, wow, she actually went out of academia. And then my partner said, well, you make it sound as if it's something really special, but it's just a career switch. And we think that we're in such a special domain, uh, and, and, and we do so, and, and at the same time, we very much realize that the work that we're doing on a daily basis is not that healthy, again. So, f saying this out here, out loud, uh, I mean, I've done it before, but it's, it's, it should be done way more often and that should be recognized, that should be rewarded as well. Well, maybe not rewarded, but at least re recognized. Um, and the punishment uh, of people who do so and speak up, uh, whether it's in Groningen or elsewhere, yeah, that is something that we should reflect on more thoroughly and perhaps reverse in some instances, definitely. Yeah. 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 Maybe to, to close off due to the lack of time, um, what would you say is the most promising um, that's going on within recognition and rewards right now? What is a development you really find promising? Opening up. I mean, that, that is what recognition and rewards is doing, but we have to go f further, way further. What does it mean to, to, to do our work? 
uh, what is excellence if we are doing unhealthy work and we deliver excellent products? Is it, is it actually excellent? Is that what we mean by excellence? Um, so it's, it's a start. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it, as with everything, uh, like tackling organized crime, which is one of my research fields, uh, long adem. It, 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 takes, it takes a long time before we're going to get there. And maybe also accept that we, our generation with a permanent contract that wants to change things, are not going to reap the benefits. Maybe it's the generations afterwards. I think that is also a realization that perhaps should be made more often. You're still young, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last but not least, what would you say is the most promising development right now going on with recognition and rewards? And maybe assessment as well? I find it difficult to say what is the most promising development. I, I think I agree. It's, it's, it's talking to each other about what we find important. I think we've waited uh, a long time to, uh, to do that again. We sort of accepted that there were some kinds of indicators that we want to uh, adhere to. And now we're having these, co these types of uh, conversations. Uh, and what I also find very promising is that we are, we're, we're growing a number of people who are getting involved and who want to speak up. Um, including people on, on senior positions, because I personally think, so today I think we're also talking a lot about early career perspectives. Um, it is very important that they tell us what direction we want to go in the future, but there's a huge responsibility to people in senior positions who have a lot of uh, power, it is just the way it is, to make those changes. It's very difficult to do that on temporary basis or any junior position. If you're a PhD student and your professor tells you to go in one direction, it's super difficult to go against it. So I think a lot of the burden for change is on, well, on me, for example, yeah. and on many of the, the more senior people here. And I see a lot of people accept, accepting that and taking responsibility. So maybe that's the answer to your question. Yeah, it sounds uh, promising. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Give them a warm hand, Jaren Eski and Marike Adriaanse. Thank you. Um, meanwhile, uh, our minister entered. Uh, we are very pleased that the Minister of Education, Culture and Science is with us today, Robert Dijkhaaf. Please give him a warm hand. <laughs> I, um, so maybe this question might seem rude to start with, but uh, why are you here today? Why is this important? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I think um, it's, it's great to be back here, uh, I would say in uh, my old life. Uh, but I think actually I'm here because I'm incredibly proud on the um, Recognition Awards program. Um, it has been, I think, really effective. It, a lot of things change in a short time. And actually, I speak a lot to my uh, international colleagues. And they are actually jealous of what the Netherlands is doing. So I'm particularly proud. I feel that we are leading the way. And I must say, you know, in general, we talk about academia. We talk about uh, all the wonderful things we do in education and research. But I think sometimes we have to think about uh, basically our own lives, you know, how did we form and shape academia? And, and I think an important message is that this is largely self-inflicted, right? The culture that we have is something that we should be very proud of. Uh, academia is not the real world, it should not be. Um, but uh, I think this, uh, this sense of empowerment, the sense that uh, more and more we feel that we can actually change things, mm -hmm. uh, our own lives, the way we uh, try to make things better. I think, you know, that I find very inspiring. Yeah. And I must say from a larger picture, if you just see what's being asked of academia in terms of solving the big problems, you know, uh, connecting to society, communicating to the people at large, commu communicating to politics, there are so many things asked of us that I think is quite necessary also. Yeah. That we look how, you know, what is our community? What are our values? Um, how do we want to organize ourselves? Yeah. And how, how would you see your own role as a minister in this <laughs> movement? This, this is a movement, right? Well, um, of course, you know, I'm in some sense, you know, uh, as a minister, you're not very powerful to, to change this. Uh, uh, but I'm trying to encourage it. Um, we are financially supporting it. 
I think you know all the plans we make with our universities, uh, with uh, basically with all the educational institutions, with the research institutes, we say, please you know, take into account this program, whatever you do, and um, so we bring it under your attention. And then actually in the more international uh, framework. I'm actually kind of pushing these two. We are, we in the Netherlands are pushing this on the European agenda, on the international agenda, because you know, academia is so such a global community. It doesn't make sense just to change the culture here in the Netherlands if it isn't changed elsewhere else. And I mean, sometimes that's the criticism. You know, are you going to make a, a culture that's so foreign from? Uh, uh, those in other in other countries, and then you would move you to another position, and you certainly have to adapt to a different culture. So I think important too that we uh, spread the message, yeah. and we do actually. And uh, often I'm in international fora, and people say, "Well, there's somebody from the Netherlands; they know how <laughs> modern assessment works." And I think, "Well, I don't know. At least we're trying. <laughs> we're trying." Yes, yes. Well, we'll do that today, right? Yes. I, I believe earlier you called it our. Uh, it's an export product. It's really, yeah, I think it is. Uh, it should be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, so you will join the round table with uh, two early career uh, academics, but uh, what was your own experience with um, assessment culture when you were an early career well, academic? Well, f I mean, I think I, um, I was a very, I, I think I was an atypical student uh, in the sense that uh, my interests were more, much more broad than just theoretical physics, but I felt very strongly, well, this is the culture. Um, I'm also good at adapting, so I thought, okay, this is what I should do. And uh, so this is the path you should follow, and apparently these are the rules. Now, in retrospect, you ask the question, why did I accept this, you know? Particular, I think, you know, in academia, because we are so proud that we're so critical and we ask all these deep questions. I never asked myself the question, why is the culture as it is? Uh, why, indeed, uh, do we have these very narrow ways to assess quality? And I often think, you know, uh, you know it's so important that we, as a community, are inclusive uh, in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I had an experience. I was in the US and we were talking about inclusivity, and then my counterpart said, no, 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 inclusion is the wrong word. It should be expansion, because it's not about whether you fit into the system, but whether the system adapts to you. And then you feel, well, probably along the way, we, uh, we missed a lot of talent. That felt, and it just was mentioned, it, it could be on the, on, in gender, in, 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 in color, but I think it could also just be in mentality. Uh, the fact that you say, well, this is such a high, uh, performance, it's so individual, uh, you know, that I don't feel at home. Yeah. And I think that actually is a terrible waste. So uh, in my own experience, I felt I just made it, but I could have easily not have made it because uh, the culture was not a very natural one for me. Yeah. But did you work your way around it or because you didn't question the culture back then? I think I'm a very good adapter, so, yeah. <laughs> so I adapted to it. And then I think one thing, and then it's, it's interesting, once you're in a more senior position, I think, you start to realize, wait a moment, uh, these rules are all made up by us. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the most important message that I didn't get. Very few people outside academia have strong opinions how academia should be organized. Yeah. Uh, all the metrics are actually coming from academia. Uh, politicians didn't think of the age index, uh, no. you know, and, and they don't care, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think, no, honestly, they do not. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, the, this, this uh, sense that, wait a moment, you know, this, we have, we can take action, we can change this. Yeah. Uh, I think I find that very powerful and often feel that academia should be something of a laboratory uh, to do different things, so we have much more flexibility, I think, than many other jobs in the way we organize, organize our lives. Yeah. We organize ourselves. Uh, I'm very proud that, for instance, you know, I'm a, a particle physicist, and I think particle physicists figured out how to do an experiment with 10,000 people and spread the credit. Um, so I think because you do crazy things which are pushing frontiers, I think we should also be open to developing new ways to uh, appreciate people, um, teamwork, you know, reaching out, uh, leadership. The fact that you, I often say, you know, you, 
you, you need flexibility. It's not only to have more space for and be more, you know, expand, expand so that you can include more, but also be more flexible in time. And there's so many things we can do, I think, in academia that could be a role model also, how other parts of society are organized. And I think that's why I'm so enthusiastic about this, because I feel, in general, in science, you're doing things that are literally experiments, yeah. and then they escape, so to say, the lab, and infect the rest of the world. <laughs> and honestly, I'm often in other People parts... People are scared if things escape from labs. Nowadays. I know, it's the wrong <laughs> metaphor. It's the wrong <laughs> metaphor. But, uh, uh, but honestly, I, sometimes I'm in other parts of society and I say you deserve a recognition and rewards program. Yeah. In many parts of our society, which, uh, and I think so, I hope that this new way of thinking, what people can contribute, what the qualities are. Um, and there was this question, I, I found a fascinating question, you know, will the same people be rewarded again? Uh, perhaps not, but it would again be uh, a waste if again a small group gets rewarded, a different group or something. And I think in the end we want to reward everyone in some yeah. sense because we need everyone. And uh, so I find that uh, a very uplifting uh, vision. Yeah. yeah. Shall we ask our early career academics to join us? Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, uh, Onur Sahin, a postdoctoral researcher, post researcher at the Social and Behavioral Sciences Faculty at Utrecht University. Um, he uh, also advises the SBS Faculty HR Department on the diversity policies and is involved with the university's EDI office to work towards a more inclusive uh, university. And amongst others, he does more. Give him a warm hand, Onur Sahin. Um, and Sharis Mahea Kaya, you know her, uh, she joined you for a day, right? Uh, uh, as a, is an assistant professor in the Global Health Research Group at the UMC Utrecht. She founded the First Generation Fund and University Pioneers Community to encourage first generation students to make the most of their talents. Uh, and she has been a member of Young Science in Transition. Please give her a warm welcome. <laughs> uh, oh no, uh, what would you say uh, could research, uh, sorry, recognition and rewards mean for you as an early career academic? What are you expecting from it? Not much, actually. Ah. Um, well, <laughs> not in the way it is currently set up. Because okay. also if we look at the roadmap, it's talking about uh, diversif diversifying and vitalizing career paths, but it's talking about assistant, associate, and full professors. It's not talking about mm -hmm. PhDs or postdocs. Yeah. And I also partly understand that, right? Because if we look at the current system, as a PhD, you're working towards this end goal, this uh, ceremony, your defense. And the only thing we talk about during the defense is the research. But the only thing uh, the, the ceremony is about is about the chapters you wrote in your dissertation. And for some supervisors, there's even a focus on quantity, right? You need to have published this amount of uh, chapters. So that's also there. Yeah. So we could change so, the PhD defense, for instance. Yeah, the whole tra trajectory, actually, I think. But that's very difficult. So I think we need a lot more uh, changes, also uh, in the recognition rewards uh, uh, di discussions or uh, what, what we try to implement. It's all focused on senior positions and not so much on the more junior positions. Yeah. Okay, let's continue this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Charisma, what does it mean for you? Uh, yeah, I can relate to that. Um, but for me, it's very important to focus on good supervision. So what's good quality research and, and how can your supervisors support in that? And I think uh, this development really improves this yeah, conversation. But at the same time, um, because I think I had very the luck of my supervisors, which really uh, supported me to focus on uh, writing articles, to do research, but they also give me the room to develop myself, also regarding my language challenges, for instance, or my first generation problems. Um, and that's, I think, the most important thing, that like, if we speak about this development, it's, it's not only about research, but also about your personal development. Yeah. And what do you need as an early career academic? What's maybe not there yet? What would um, help? So if you speak about this development, uh, because let me first start positive, because 
Um, I'm really happy with this, with this development and also with the different career profiles. But still, when I read, uh, for instance, the roadmap or the annual, uh, how do you call it, the annual um, report, oh, the report. Yeah. Uh, there's still very little mentioning uh, about early career academics, but still I do think that the steering committee think about us, but if you don't see it and can't read about it, then we don't know. And how do they collect our perspectives? So that's, I think, a big lack. Yeah. And uh, what more would you need or uh, how would you like to be assessed since today we're talking about rethinking assessment? I think I'd like to have a say in what I want to be assessed on. Mm -hmm. I think, so if I want to develop myself more into teaching, I should have the opportunity to also be assessed on that, but also the opportunity to, the opportunity to develop myself in teaching. And the same goes for uh, the, if I want to uh, be uh, evaluated on my valorization, for example. Yeah. Right? But I think it, sh it should be individual. It shouldn't be forced on everyone to do all these things. But I think people should have a say. And yeah, I want to do this, uh, do this more and develop myself in these uh, uh, skills. Yeah. So you want options and then you can become better in one of those. Yeah, I think that would help, like more flexibility in these positions, in these junior positions to be like, yeah, I want to develop myself in this uh, aspect or, or this aspect, yeah. in addition to the research, which is also, of course, very important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Minister, what do you think? I think these are very, very good remarks, because indeed, uh, if we think about a uh, more creative career path, then the right question is, OK, if you're going to prepare for this, so in the whole education, uh, to, to which sense are you preparing for that? Um, I don't think that the problem is, so basically what I'm hearing, the, the standard PhD is a very, I think, well, it's many centuries old way to prepare people to be independent researchers. It's, of course, says nothing about your teaching, your outreach, your entrepreneurship, etc. So I think it's very good to see, perhaps we need to diversify to our, our educational model. And perhaps the whole hierarchical model of academia, I don't know, but it's still a little bit organized like an army, something. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> is that the right model? And I think it's good to ask these questions. I don't have all the answers, yeah. but I think it's good to ask these questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have the idea that you have a diversified career path? Or do you still have the idea, oh, I'm in academia, I have this one career path? No, I think like here in Utrecht, um, I think we are a bit ahead of that. Like we really have different career profiles and uh, there's plenty of room, I think, to develop yourself, for instance, uh, at science uh, or public engagement. But still at the end, um, which was mentioned earlier, like of course you have to be a good researcher to publish it. And um, I think at the end of the day, that's still important. Um, but still, like for us, early career academics, I'm still wondering what's in it for us. So, for instance, also based on the recent investments, what, what can we do like to, because I, at the moment I have a one year contract, so what can I do next year to get a fixed? Yeah, I, I don't know really. So, um, and so do you, what, so what do you talk companies? about it with your colleagues or with fellow? Uh, yeah, uh, so I talk about it uh, to my line manager. Um, but they, uh, but it's still, there's no really a clear answer, so, um, yeah. yeah. So you also need, besides maybe a culture change, also formal ways or yeah. career path. Yeah, but explicitly for early career academics, I yeah. think. Yeah, oh no? Yeah, I can relate to that. So, um, uh, yes, I have, uh, uh, I can do things besides research, but it's also a lot of, uh, it costs me a lot of my, own time because I'm, I'm really interested in social impact so I do a lot of these activities but also I do it like on top of the things that I'm already supposed to do yeah right it's not structurally embedded in that it is possible to uh, spend uh, this amount of time on these things um, um, and in terms of teaching the options are there but um, uh, like it has changed now but when I first started my PhD I had to look for okay, I'm getting these students to supervise now, but I never took a course on teaching. And they were offered, mm -hmm. but I had to actively look for them myself. Now this has changed. Now uh, these are 
uh, uh, bit, is a bit more proactive, like uh, telling new PhD students, like, these are the courses, please take them, etc. Yeah. Um, so there are developments, but I think this could be a lot uh, uh, more structural and, uh, uh, yeah, more actively yeah. promoted. So you've and seen also the change already in the yes, last, last change, couple of yes. years. Yeah. And I think it's also because of the feedback that I gave, for example, on this, like, this is a bit weird, and then we had these discussions. Yeah. Are yeah. you being heard? Is there a way you can share your insights and ideas as an early career academic? Yeah, I think so. So I, I think you can write uh, opinions, uh, participate in this kind of stuff. Yeah, you're being heard right now. Uh, but <laughs> at the same time, like we already, with Young Science and Transition, we, are, we already ask for more representation in the steering group um, for early career academics. And I know the Young Academy is there, but I wonder whether, whether that is the real reflection of Early career academics. They're too um, old. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, no, 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 but I'm also <laughs> a bit nervous to say this. Yeah. Because it's a difficult question, but yeah. I think those difficult questions Great. have to be asked. Yeah. And of course, um, but it's not only talking, let's, let's do it. And, but I, I can't see it right now. Yeah. So, but you already said, please um, make sure that our perspective of early career. Cr yeah, so I would like to see representation of. For instance, uh, uh, Promo Vendi Network Nederland, uh, Bozo Cornell, uh, 07, for instance. Just I w and I see it at the table. Yeah, but yeah. in case that isn't possible, I would like to see something about it in the roadmap or in the, okay. uh, I don't know, in the strategy. Yeah. Minister? Well, I think these are incredibly valuable points because, uh, I mean, in some sense, in, in the old system, whatever its limitations was, I think as a young person, it was a very clear message what you had to do to be, become successful. So you had to write this one paper, look at lots of citations, and then you know how to go take next step. Now you're basically saying, what's well, wonderful, there are all these opportunities, but how do I find my way in the landscape? It's not fixed. How do I navigate it? So I think these are very serious questions. I think the many people here I see in the audience who are in positions to coach you, etc. So I think there's a very important message for academic leadership to have these conversations with earlier career and in some sense, you know, help you navigate uh, the future. And so uh, you know, what should you do, should you not do? And I think it's all a little bit confusing because in some sense the landscape is changing, right? We're talking about new opportunities, new ways to reward, but it's still all in flux. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine, you know, in some sense we're going through a transition and we want to do it. I where think, are we? Where are we exactly? Yeah. And, you know, you want to go through a transition, but at every point in time, you want to in some sense be in equilibrium. You no, know, you want to make sure that young people are not getting very confused or that you send mixed messages. And I think it would be terrible if young people say, well, okay, now I can do this. You know, I can spend much more time in education or an impact. And then you figure out five years later that, no, well, actually, we're not going to uh, take that into account. And I think that would actually, I think that would be harmful. Yeah. So I think that's something that has to be avoided. Yeah. And I also think that, like, the broader perspective is really necessary because in my direct environment, I don't think that many, a lot of people are aware of this development at, at all. Mm. So, therefore, I think it's really necessary to have also other people um, at the table. Yeah. And also to promote there are other options. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, no, maybe last words. What do you hope for the near future with research, uh, sorry, for recognition and reward? Yeah, um, last words. Uh, uh, I, I, I just hope that indeed it, 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 they will think more about, um, you know, so the core activities of the university are uh, research, but also teaching and valorization, and there's this whole movement. Um, but please think about um, how are we preparing the early career academics for this? Yeah. Um, are they well prepared enough to enter uh, a, a new position in which everything is different? because a lot of the diverse activities and skills and, and things are valued, but yeah. they were only focused really so much on writing the dissertation yeah. only. Yeah, so, and um, maybe so it's, diversify it's really your PhD already, I so, think so yes. that it doesn't start when you finish your PhD. It's also a preparation, right, for the next career step. It's a logical step. Yeah. 
Okay, last words. <laughs> that's a yeah, okay, last yeah, no. words, but that's a really difficult point, I think, because like the core task of doing a PhD is to learn to do good research and to publish. So that's important to, yeah, to have a mind. Um, but if I think it's more about yeah. the supervision around it. Yeah. And I think there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, room of improvement over there. Yeah. Or maybe what, what was said earlier, that if we're rethinking excellence and assessment and research is maybe also about open science and communicating, and that's also broader, maybe. Yeah. Okay, please give them a warm hand, the minister, Robert Eika, Oli Usain, and Charisma Heakaya. Thanks. Um, so, as Kim uh, mentioned before, we have a great amount of wonderful workshops, uh, and we will start now with the uh, first round of workshops. Uh, there will be two rounds of workshops, and uh, in between you also get lunch, which is great, of course. Um, you, have, you have badges, I mean, where it says where your workshop is, I believe. Uh, how do you get there? Uh, you have to go outside of the church, and then uh, to the right, there's a, a University of Humanistic Studies, and there are the workshops. Uh, it's like a two-minute walk, so you don't need your coat. Um, and no worries, there's coffee and tea and water and so on in the workshop room. I don't know, is, if, is, is it pouring outside? No, okay. Um, and um, at the beginning, you got a little card where you can write down uh, the answers on two questions. Uh, and uh, what, di what did you learn today? And you can fill it in later. And what would you like to share? So I'll get back to that in the plenary closing session. So please share your ideas. Uh, we will see each other again during lunch and then after the workshop, the second round of workshops for the plenary uh, closing uh, session. Thank you very much for being here in the first part. Enjoy the workshops. Um, and uh, hopefully, if the live stream is working, thank you for being here with us today as well. Thank you. Thank you.